We've developed a new weight loss incentive program here at CSIS. We squeeze so many chairs up on the table that only thin people can accom be accommodated. I like to say that before they've come in so you won't know that I've insulted a couple of them. Oh, we have a saying here that a meeting is so popular that people are almost sitting next to each other. You know, and that's kind of, <laughs> kind of where we are today. This is a, obviously quite an interesting, interesting uh, topic. Um, this, is, this is going to start looking like a Dutch master's painting here, you know, with a bunch of grumpy old white guys on one side of the table, you know. Because uh, they, know, they know what they got to do over the next... Yeah, they know what they've got to do over the next uh, couple of months, and they're not happy, you know. And, uh, uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm pleased that you're all here. Uh, you know, ironically, this is kind of the, where the real process of government happens, because it's, uh, you know, governing is about trying to understand uh, what the implications are of your ideas before you do them. And uh, we don't do enough of that, frankly. We don't do enough of actually trying to solicit and understand the implications. And I really do take, uh, take my hat off and congratulate uh, Secretary Carter and uh, Brett Lambert here for seeing the, the importance of getting systematically getting together with industry and the private sector to understand, you know, what are the implications of the trajectory that we're on. I mean, this is the, this is the best of government. This is what, uh, what we do need to do. Um, I have been, uh, and I apologize for not having been here uh, for Secretary Carter's presentation when uh, he announced this, uh, but I've been tracking it fairly, fairly closely. And, and the, the level of suspicion and skepticism is intense. That's all I can say. I mean, there's, it's amazing. Oh, no, 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 that's not, a, that's not an applause line. Uh, but it, but you know, people are really nervous about it. And, and I can understand why, because you know, we are at the front end of what probably is a pivot point with defense budgets. You know, and we, we, anytime we're running deficits that you measure with scientific notation, you know, you know we got a problem. And the pressure is on. I, uh, I lived through 14 years of declining defense budgets myself. I mean, I, my timing was perfect. I got out just when they started going up. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and it's painful. And of course, everybody's nervous about what that means in this environment. And so uh, I, I know from many conversations with Secretary Carter how, how deeply committed he is for a fair and honest process. But, you know, in the kind of world we're in, you're always worried about it. And so that's why this, these sessions are so important. It's really crucial that we have this understanding with each other. Now, uh, I, when I, I say to, to all of you, my friends and my friends in government, uh, it is really crucial that we make an efficiency agenda work. Now, I know everybody's skeptical about efficiency agendas. You know, I, you know, God knows I've been through a lot of them myself. But um, it's the only time the department gets to keep, it's, keep the money. I mean, if, if we let it go forward, it gets stripped away at OMB or it gets stripped away on the Hill. We're going to lose it. So if, if we genuinely can find a pathway where we get um, efficiencies inside the department, we get to keep that. So obviously we want to do this. We want to make that successful. At the same time, uh, I've seen a lot of efficiency drills that turn into uh, scalp hunting exercises, you know, where you got to go out and get enough scalps and bring them home. And it doesn't quite matter where you get them. And you know, it's that dynamic that we've got to avoid, where this isn't just a drill you know, to capture enough scalps and bring them back to the tribal chief. You know, so it's real. And, uh, and there's enormous pressure when the boss, in this case the secretary, puts out a target on the wall and says $100 billion. You know, there's a tremendous incentive you know, for, the, for all the, the members of the tribe to go out and get scalps. 
rather than to make this thing what it really is intended to be, which is a genuine effort at efficiency. And so it's, a, it's hugely important that we go through this process honestly with each other. Uh, it doesn't remove any of the skepticism people have, but we're going to earn each other's trust by how we interact with each other. And the session today is for Brett to outline the process by which the government wants to hear you and is going to try to take to heart and evaluate and then act on what you're offering. So we all need to listen carefully, and let's listen carefully with a, with, a, with a constructive heart because that's what it's gonna take to make this thing a success. Uh, it could fail lots of ways, most, most plausibly because people act on you know, on their biases rather than, than, than a, a conviction of goodwill. So let's, let's start with the process of trying to say we've got to find a way for everybody for this to work so that it's good for the department and good for the essential partners to the department, and that's in industry. So, Brett, are you going to be the, or David, are you going to, I have a couple of you're going to kick off for real, and I'll get out of the way. Thank you. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you all for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks David. Good morning. Uh, I'm David Berto. Thank you, Dr. Hamry, for, uh, for joining us here. He's, uh, really appreciate that, and, and I think the sentiment is, uh, is, is quite profound. Um, I have a couple of administrative remarks. Of course, I want to welcome you on behalf of CSIS. This is a, a real honor for us to be able to host a discussion like this. I actually think that we have all the talent in the room necessary to make this a success. So our plan is to lock the doors, and you all leave when the directive is written. Does that sound like a good approach? I, I, yeah. the, uh, it'll save us a lot of time in the, in the, the, the long run. Um, I do have a couple of administrative announcements before, before I uh, turn the floor over to uh, Mr. Lambert. One is, would you silence your noisemakers so that uh, they don't uh, interfere with the process here? Um, the second is I would like to note that uh, uh, for those who have called in, uh, one of the efficiencies that we've exercised here is it's one-way communication. You should be able to hear us, that is, when we have the microphones on and are speaking into it, uh, and, uh, but we will not be able to hear you. If you do have questions that you want raised, uh, you can email them to me at dbertau at csis.org. The folks in the room, I don't expect you to be emailing to me. Um, we've actually put a blanket on the uh, so transmissions won't occur. Um, the, uh, the agenda is that uh, I will introduce Mr. Lambert, and uh, he has some remarks, and then we'll hear from each of the working groups uh, to the extent that that's part of the program. Then we'll open the floor for <coughs> questions and answers. We're going to try to have the questions focus on the representatives from industry because that is the reason we're holding this event. Uh, so to my CSIS colleagues, you'll have to wait for a, another opportunity to raise your uh, questions uh, and I'm pretty sure that um, that this process is going to, as we'll hear shortly, uh, will take a few more uh, weeks before it brings to completion. So there will be ample ample opportunity for those kinds of questions to be raised uh, and answered later on. So uh, I believe with that um, uh, I will introduce uh, the director of industrial policy and our uh, host for this morning's event or our, our master for this morning's event, Mr. Brett Lambert. Thank you. I'll uh, try to be brief so we can get to uh, the real meat of the subject, but I did want to say a, a, just a few words and uh, also want to extend my thanks to Dr. Hamry in particular. He has the unique experiences I think everyone in this room knows of not just uh, having lived on both sides of these types of efforts, but, uh, but knowing uh, what, not just what needs to be done, but actually how to, how to do that, and we've been guided by him. Uh, uh, in this effort, and I really can't say enough about uh, his, um, his help in this. The same is true with CSIS in general. I think we all are uh, here today. Uh, we all know the role, the important role CSIS has played over the years uh, in bridging uh, industry and the, and the government, and we appreciate their continued uh, support for that. Uh, and also, thanks for all of you for coming, and also all the people, I don't know how many hundreds or however are on the phone uh, across the country for this initiative. I also want to thank uh, my colleagues. I think now this is their third full-time job. Uh, I can assure you that most of them came from work to this morning's meeting, uh, uh, and they will be going back there shortly. I'm going to introduce them um, in, a, in a moment. But I just wanted to take a, a moment to step back and talk about the initiative in a broader context. On May 8th, uh, Secretary Gates spoke at the Eisenhower Library. Being from Kansas, I was very happy about that. 
Uh, but he spoke about the need for the department and industry to recognize and respond to the programmatic and fiscal challenges we will face over the coming decade. For Deputy Secretary Lynn has subsequently described a variety of efforts needed to achieve the vision outlined by the Secretary. And on June 28th, in this very room, Under Secretary Carter was joined by the senior leadership of AT&L as well as all of the acquisition executives to lay out a specific, the specific areas we in the department will focus our energy and attention on over the coming months as part of what is now being called the Efficiency Initiative. As demonstrated later that day by the fact that the Secretary of Defense himself joined Dr. Carter in a public rollout of the initiative, we are building, we in the building are serious and committed to this effort. I want to just say a few words about the specific goals of the initiative. Then I'd like to take a bit of time talking about the process, the timing, and then introduce the representatives of the team leads and have them briefly, very briefly, describe the areas they're working on. Then we'll look forward to taking any questions you may have. First, let me talk about the initiative in broad terms, as there's been much speculation, and is always the case in this town, much skepticism. The bottom line is we need to do more without more. From an industrial base and policy perspective, we recognize the need for serious and thoughtful industry input into our decision-making processes as we move forward. I can't think of an undersecretary of at &L more committed to being open and transparent, as well as seeking sincere dialogue with our industry partners than Dr. Carter and now Principal Deputy Secretary, Mr. Kendall. Many of you have been in our offices over the last year, and I hope that is demonstrated through our actions that we're serious about our desire to be open and transparent as possible with industry. That doesn't mean we're always going to agree on issues. In fact, sometimes we won't. It does mean we need to disagree agreeably. <coughs> Both sides need to listen, and when one of us is doing something that is not in the best interest of the taxpayer and the warfighter, we should be called upon it, and we should take corrective action. We in the department cannot succeed in this effort unless we fully engage our industrial partners. We've tried this in the past and it has failed. We plan to do more than just listen to the issues you raise and the suggestions you make. If you have solid ideas backed by empirical data that are in the best interest of the taxpayer and the warfighter, we will act on these suggestions. Key to this effort will be your input, cooperation, and support. We are committing a significant amount of senior level time and we're serious about getting this right. And we hope that our industrial partners will do the same. We all must redouble our efforts to be better stewards of the taxpayer's dollar. Over the last decade, the issues we are addressing have grown in size, complexity, and cost. This initiative is just the beginning of a process to fix these problems moving forward and to ensure that the department and industry do not fall again into the habits where double-digit growth in defense spending was our response to poor business practices, both inside and outside the building. As we move forward, we must reverse the cost growth in our programs and obtain the needed services more efficiently. We will focus on future actions the department can undertake, which may be supported by anecdotal experiences of our industry partners in the past, but these stories alone will not be sufficient to drive our changes. While the effective result of the specific policy guidelines we intend to announce will, in, will hopefully prevent past anecdotes from reoccurring, we're looking forward, not attempting to correct perceived past mistakes. We are all in this together, and we're all patriots. We succeed or fail together in this effort. If we don't get this unique opportunity right, we in the Pentagon lose, our warfighters lose, the taxpayers lose, and industry along with their shareholders will lose. The alternative to an efficiency effort is to cancel major weapon systems whose costs continue to rise, halt or scale back new production to pay old bills, and sacrifice future innovation at the altar of near-term expediency. This option is not good for industry. It's not good for the taxpayer. It's not good for our warfighters, and it would have consequences for our national security for generations to come. Again, the bottom line is we need to do more without more. Now let me speak briefly about the overall structure and the process we plan uh, to use in this effort. What you see here is our uh, internal 
uh, we've created, as, as Dr. Carter uh, mentioned on uh, the 28th, uh, we've created five teams, and the representatives of those five teams are here uh, today. Uh, these are senior level uh, people with, with, I think, collective experience. I think of the meeting that was held, and again, these meetings are happening on weekends. They're happening uh, pretty much 24-7 in the building now. I think the collective experience, somebody added it up with several hundred years of contracting experience inside the department that are on these, these various teams. Some of you, whoever clapped last time, may think that's a bad thing, but I actually think it's a, it's a good thing. Um, these five teams will be meeting to look uh, both internally and to take ideas from industry uh, and figure out which buckets they go in. Some may come in, in more than one buckets, uh, more than one bucket. Uh, in, on a parallel path to that are two other uh, groups. The military departments themselves have had a series of initiative efforts, and we want to make sure we're capturing the work they've already done. And then this team, the reason we're here today, uh, will uh, allow industry to have input. We will be taking that input through the Office of Industrial Policy. Uh, if you visited the website, there's a simple form. It is simple, but that is just the first step to make sure we're getting as, as casting a broad as net as possible to get ideas, and then we will be reaching out individually. We already have received some very specific ideas that I think are, are productive, and I'm hoping we'll work our way into uh, into the directive uh, that Dr. Carter will sign uh, that I'll talk about in just a moment. But let me be clear, the input from industry has to come through the Office of Industrial Policy for a whole number of reasons. One of them is just coordination, but there are other legal reasons. We cannot, uh, the folks that are here uh, can't reach out directly to industry, uh, and industry cannot reach out directly to them. So please, from this point forward, funnel your questions, your concerns, your comments through our office, and we will be operating, we will facilitate how to get those ideas uh, to the working groups themselves. And we will give you feedback on when that is happening and how it is happening. Um, there is uh, the two executive directors, uh, Jim Thompson and Katrina McFarland, who I'll introduce in a, in a moment, are here. They will oversee the, the staffing of the process and make sure that at the uh, senior integration group, which is uh, comprised of the senior executives of um, service acquisition executives, but also the senior staff of Dr. Carter's team. Dr. Carter himself will be the chair of that team. Um, uh, we are meeting, uh, seems hourly, uh, uh, on, this, on this initiative, but uh, again, to, to, I think uh, not, not just to demonstrate, but to show how important this is inside the building. These meetings are also taking place on weekends, uh, and, and we are we are really dedicated to trying to get this right because I think Dr. Hamray had a perfect point. If we don't get it right, somebody will, will get it wrong for us. Uh, so we are very motivated uh, inside the building uh, to get it right. Uh, just on timing, uh, how did we get here and where we're going? Uh, uh, we had our, th this first initial uh, meeting with industry. Again, this is very much about us trying to communicate to industry what our timeline is. And, uh, and the path we're on and, and to uh, help you better understand the inputs we're hoping to get. There'll be a series of these meetings uh, through August and, uh, and September. And then uh, this, will be, this is a parallel path to the internal operations that are occurring uh, within the five working groups. Each one of them has a slightly different uh, schedule and timeline, but this is the outreach uh, part to industry. And I would encourage everyone to go to the website uh, uh, at osd.mil, but also if you go to our industrial policy website, you'll see uh, that there's a, a link there uh, for the at least the initial form. But uh, you know that this is this is how we would like to initially receive input uh, from industry ideas, suggestions. We realize that a lot of the information we may be getting will be uh, uh, competition sensitive, and that's yet another reason we want to direct everything through uh, our. Uh, office to ensure that we can control that uh, as we move forward. Uh, and with that, I would like to, uh, to introduce Jim and, and Katrina. Jim's the Principal uh, Civilian Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Navy, and Katrina McFarland's the Director of Acquisition for MDA. And uh, they, when we first um, started talking about this initiative some time ago with Dr. Carter and, and uh, uh, he made it quite clear that he wanted the best and brightest from all the teams. He wanted SESs and above. He wanted, he just wanted people who had experience and were, and uh, and everyone nodded their head in the senior executive leadership teams. And then he said, "This is going to be their second full-time job for the next few months." 
And then everyone said, no, that doesn't seem so fun. So, um, uh, but with that, I'll introduce uh, the two of them. And if, uh, if they want to introduce or talk briefly about the, the team or Jim. If Jim, if I could, I, I have an administrative request uh -oh. before you guys uh, take the stage. Uh, this is a request to the people on the telephones. Um, I would like you all to mute your phones. Uh, apparently, the, there, there's a lot of background noise that's coming through to the other listeners. So if everybody who's on the call can mute your own phones and cut down the uh, transmission, that would be helpful to those who are not in this room. Thanks. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you. Uh, you know, let me just echo what uh, Brett has said. Thank you for being here. Uh, we're very interested in, in uh, uh, your ideas and your input. It's, it's crucial to us to be successful uh, to do that. Uh, before I say a few other words, let me just say, you know, those of us who work in the Pentagon feel like we're on the edge and living on the ledge every day. So <laughs> I, I am literally, uh, <clears throat> so I'm just going to move one foot on firm ground over here while I, <laughs> while I talk. But uh, just a couple of very quick uh, brief comments, and then uh, Katrina has some more things uh, uh, to follow up on. Uh, I just want to echo really the motivation quotient behind this. Uh, uh, there's a lot of reasons to be motivated to do this, and those of us who have had a front row seat in each of our services uh, uh, or even at OSD to see the number of programs that come through and the challenges that come along with those, uh, that alone is motivation enough for us to continue to do better at the kind of business we're in every day. But in this particular instance, uh, Secretary Carter has reminded uh, Katrina and I that, and the whole group, that this really is an opportunity to shift, okay, from uh, uh, some overhead kinds of uh, uh, equities and dollars into more product. And that really is the motivation. So instead of buying 100 units for one price, we'd like to squeeze out maybe 103 units for the same price. And that's, that's the journey and the real intensity of the journey that we're on uh, here with this group. And I just want to really echo that and encourage you all to think that way as you're working through this. And those of you on the side of the, on the business side, um, you live in that every day, you know, really looking for ways to shift uh, more dollars into your product line and perhaps less in the, in the overhead structure of your companies and so forth. And we need those ideas. We really do. And we're going to be very open to those. And again, Katrina and I, our role in this fundamentally is uh, really integration agents on the part you see up there on the chart. Okay. We need your ideas. We need the ideas from the rest of the, uh, uh, members here, and our job is to really integrate those. So with that, I'm going to ask Katrina to, to follow up and, and uh, uh, go through some of the individual parts of what we're doing. Great. Um, just as a comment, first of all, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is the opportunity uh, that we need to take advantage of. Uh, when you're submitting your ideas, uh, I want to give you a reinforcement. The activity that we're charged to do, and I know you all read Brett's letter, but I want to emphasize that we're retaining the budget. It's not a decrement. So the work that we're doing is to find ways of getting, as Brett said, uh, more for no more. So we're incentivized to do this because we're not asked to take a hatchet or a bologna slice out of what we have for TOAs in the agencies and services. And our initiatives are to take a look at how we could do the business more efficiently and effectively to get uh, down to getting that public dollar uh, further along in developing a capability. A lot of us have engaged, uh, and I want to reflect, Becky and I want to tell you, combined we have less than 50 years of experience. But anyways, <laughs> <laughs> everybody else is old. We're really struggling with that. We actually <laughs> age in dog years up here, you know, in the kind of business we're in. Uh, I wanted to talk a moment about the team that we were blessed uh, to be part of. Uh, it is from every agency, service, uh, department. Uh, it's the top players. When we had our first meeting, the first thing that we realized very quickly was we weren't going to have to throw, to throw out bait to get these people to start thinking and bringing in ideas already. Uh, we were already having conversations about the outcome. No meeting has ever met its scheduled timeline. Uh, so we've got initiative, we've got energy, and uh, we're blessed with people who really want to make a difference. Um, so we're going to obviously do our best with whatever uh, comes from you all. Uh, please, uh, to Dr. Hamry's comments, do not take this as uh, another, uh, you know, pendulum swing. We need to do this for the country, and we need to do it now. Our economic situation speaks for itself. 
uh, when we're taking a look at what is the insurance policy for the Department of Defense, which is the defense uh, component, we need to make sure that we can provide products out to the warfighter, and we need to do it uh, fast, and we need to do it smartly. So your ideas will be endorsed by us because we've had our own frustrations in the process, and we're looking to hear from you what we don't see about ourselves. Uh, we can hold up a mirror to ourselves, but you can tell us what you really see. So what you're getting for input from me and our team is, and certainly from Brett, is we are going to very carefully self-assess. Uh, so when you're out there and you're combining your interests into these five groups, I endorse anything you put in the table that helps us understand what we can do better. Now, each of these team leads uh, have been asked to provide a few minutes uh, on what their focus areas are. Uh, you know, there's five major groups in the letter that, and the memo that was put on the table for you to look at. All of this is in there, so you're just going to get sort of a reinforcement. Uh, Dr. Carter said to us, you know, I tell people once and I tell them again and I tell them a third time. This is a process. It takes time. We don't expect all of our initiatives and our issues to come to fruition overnight. We believe some of this is going to be a long-term. Uh, we've already talked about how in the long term we'll carry it forward, ombudsmen, uh, people who are owners of this throughout the agencies and the services for the long-term implementation. So we're not just talking about a great big unveiling of an effort and then it'll start collecting dust a month later. It will have a long-reaching and enduring uh, impl implementation for it. So with that, um, I'm going to turn over. I want to sort of uh, allow the leads to introduce themselves and their backgrounds uh, and tell you about what their issues are. But I also want to tell you, as of yesterday when we met, we already had a portfolio of initiatives on the table that we're already in the process of discussion. <coughs> so we have a lot to try to accomplish, and we will be culling those down to the top initiatives. We won't dismiss initiatives, but we're definitely going to have a, a, a need to focus on the top issues to get <coughs> to a September 7th unveiling. And we will have long-term uh, processes in place to try to uncover and implement the balance. Is there anything else on that? That's good. All right, now I'm going to pass it to Becky. Good morning. I'm Becky Davies. I've been um, designated as the lead for the targeting affordability team. I'm very fortunate. I have representation of about six, or six of us on my team um, from all the services to include OSD. And as um, Katrina stated, the, the things that we're really focused on are the, the first initiatives that were outlined in Dr. Carter's letter. Um, there's certainly other things that will be added. In fact, our group has actually added one additional um, item. So I'll just kind of run through that just in general terms. We just kicked off all of our working groups last week, um, so we spent two full days this week to be able to be prepared for our um, SIG meeting that's taking place on Friday. But the targeting affordability group, one of the first initiatives we want to look at is how can we, from a, from a government standpoint, maximize the use of our will cost and our should cost estimates? Um, there are a number of things that I think we can do internal to the um, services and to the department to use those will and should cost estimates. And certainly on the should cost and will cost side, we're going to need industry support and, and input to do that, to maximize it. Um, we also want to look internally to see how we can drive affordability into our requirements process. Um, the requirements generation process is um, it's an intricate process, but there's, I think, initiatives that we can bring forward to make it better, um, to make it more transparent, and to bridge it with the acquisition community much better than we do today. Uh, we also want to look at stabilizing production rates um, and ways that um, program managers do not uh, reduce um, production numbers um, without certainly the MDA's authority to do that. And we also want to be able to look in joint programs where one program can't pull out which would affect um, production rates for, an, for another customer. Um, eliminating re uh, reduction or redundancy in our portfolios. Um, I think we need to be much more aware both across service and within services on our portfolios and how can we maximize similar um, initiatives or similar requirements. The last one that we have is leveraging real competition. And this one's going to be a tricky one because it, it entails a lot of data management issues, TDPs. How do we decide in the services what we want to take inherent government um, responsibility for over the long haul and be able to request and contract for the right kinds of data packages that allows us to go out on real competition? 
We have added one to our um, to our list. It'll kind of sit in the parking lot for now until we really get up and running. But we want to we want to really see what we can do in terms of life cycle management. Um, there are a number of issues, both um, industry and government, going on that will help us, I think, realize some efficiencies across the total life cycle. And we can't forget about sustainment. It is certainly the the largest um, cost driver. Um, out there. So those are, in a nutshell, the, the things that we're working on. Uh, again, we've got a good team going, and I'm, I think everybody will echo the same thing. And we look forward to sharing what we're doing um, with you in industry and being able to get your ideas um, and your feedback <coughs> as we go forward. So thank you. I'll turn it over. Okay. Uh, good morning. I'm Bob Griffin, I'm Director of Acquisition for the Naval Facilities Engineering Command is the day job. Uh, my team consists of myself, uh, Ed Harrington at the Army, Michael Gill with the Air Force, Cindy Shaver with the Navy, and Elliot Branch also with the Navy. Uh, my team's topic is sharpening contract terms, and our focus will be gaining efficiencies in a minimum of four major areas. The first is choosing appropriate contract types. You know, we'd like to be predictable for you guys. Uh, we're not right now. Uh, sharing the benefits of improving cash flow. If we can help you improve your cash flow, we'll see a benefit in that. Targeting non-value added costs, you know, things that we ask you to do that maybe we don't even read, but yet it costs both of us money. And uh, improving the audit process on both sides of the equation. I think there's a lot of room for improvement there. Uh, our approach is going to be to assemble working level teams to focus on each of these areas and work them hard and then bring that back to us, refine that, and then take it up to our senior groups. So that's kind of our approach to doing it. Uh, where you can help us, you know, I know with confidence that there are things that we force you to do that drive uh, you to be inefficient. And, you know, we, we blame you for being inefficient or expensive in some cases, but you're doing exactly what our demand signal requires you to do. So anything you can give us, you know, we are very interested in seeing that and working on that with you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Sean Crane. I'm the uh, director for the uh, Department of the Navy's Office of Small Business Programs. I think I'm also the only one that has three full-time jobs, so <laughs> so a member of the Navy Reserve as well. So if anyone sees my wife, send regards. Um, <laughs> The team that, uh, that I've been asked to lead uh, is on rewarding productivity and growth. And uh, as, as you'll see, as uh, you go through the documentation and you look at the comments that uh, Secretary Carter uh, put out, it's not just about uh, just finding efficiencies, but how do we reward good productivity? And how can we find methods and look at the policies that we have uh, that can reward uh, industry partners uh, and inside of government as well for doing the things that are right. The four focus areas initially, and just as Bob mentioned, uh, and as well as Becky, uh, you know, we're going to be looking to uh, take on additional areas as we uh, see that they're appropriate. The first one is aligning profit and fees uh, to circumstances. We want to make sure that uh, not only are we getting the best value for the taxpayer, but that we're also rewarding uh, companies that take on risk and that there's, there's a measured way of, of evaluating that. So uh, we're going to be looking for tools uh, on how to better uh, articulate uh, how we can reward those that uh, take on more risk to be able to uh, help provide those uh, tools and uh, platforms and weapon systems that uh, all of our uh, warfighters need. Another area, uh, the second area, is uh, in involving small business uh, in a dynamic way uh, within uh, defense contracting, both at the prime and at the subcontracting level. And uh, so I have a number of partners um, and peers uh, within uh, the Department of Defense who uh, are very interested in seeing what we can do to help encourage uh, competition an opportunity as we try to help uh, everyone uh, improve and build on that industrial base. The third area is uh, rewarding excellent uh, suppliers. Uh, you probably have seen in the last few months uh, uh, the Assistant Secretary of the Navy for RDNA uh, is proposing a, uh, a preferred suppliers uh, uh, report 
uh, to re uh, reward uh, great suppliers. We're going to be looking at this pilot uh, that the Navy is uh, doing, and we're going to be looking to see how do you reward your suppliers? How do you, as industry, uh, take note of those that help you succeed and achieve where you succeed? Because we think uh, you've probably been doing it for a, a good long time, and there's things that we can learn from. The last one is going to be uh, one that's uh, very important and I think will probably be the biggest challenge for, for my team is, and that's protecting the technology base and looking to the future. And how do we take the technologies that we're developing today so that in the future uh, we're going to have an industrial base that can support those technologies, we're going to have an ability to economically uh, build on technologies today that bridge us to the future. So look forward to... Uh, uh, working uh, on this team. Uh, I feel privileged to have been asked to uh, be a team leader, and we certainly uh, are going to be looking to see what ideas uh, industry has in these areas. Force uh, in the service acquisition arena. Uh, most of you know that our service acquisitions in recent years have grown considerably, uh, uh, taking about 53 percent of the uh, spend uh, for the department. Uh, in the past year. Uh, as a result of that, it's a target area for uh, great savings. I'll use an anecdote out of the uh, Old Testament uh, just to give you an idea of what we're looking at. Uh, David, at one point in time, uh, uh, as a combat mission support uh, individual, went to the front lines to take some food to his brothers. He was drafted into uh, an opportunity to fight uh, the giant. And in, uh, in our world today, the giant is uh, budget deficits, uh, and uh, uh, the issues that we face in our national security, uh, in the national security arena. Uh, he uh, very quickly uh, was outfitted with the armor of uh, King Saul, uh, and uh, I don't know whether a girl was standing beside uh, him who said, uh, you really look stupid in that, or if uh, he realized that he would be unwieldy in that. So uh, he traded in the armor for a sling. The critical point that we uh, have to make in the days ahead is how we can prosecute our national security strategy with uh, the minimum technology, the minimum services. And I will tell you, in looking across uh, uh, the way that we've done services in the last few years, we have a lot of services that don't need to be performed, and we have a lot of services that need to be performed that aren't being performed. And what we would like to do is we would like to move away from those things that we don't need to uh, accomplish those things that we do need. Uh, to do this, we need some good ideas coming forward from uh, each of you. Uh, we have two primary initiatives uh, under the team. Uh, the first initiative is to uh, uh, establish a department-wide structure uh, for senior level oversight of service acquisitions. We have pockets of excellence across the department. Uh, what we would like to do is see that uh, spread across the department in a way that uh, uh, where we can take full advantage of an appropriate oversight structure in the way that we build our contract strategies, write our requirements, uh, and develop, uh, develop the support services that we need going forward. Uh, we, have, uh, we have some very concrete evidence from uh, one of the uh, services that was able to carry this forward and gather metrics where it worked extremely well. Uh, some of you may know that as a part of the uh, 2008 NDAA, uh, there was an effort to uh, force all of the services to have uh, a, a this type of oversight structure, and uh, uh, we, the department, shied away from that, and so now we are looking at a way that we can put together an oversight structure that will uh, benefit the department in, in, in a very specific way. Uh, the second element, uh, which uh, kind of flows from that, is uh, as you have an oversight structure in place, you begin to look at the way you do your services. And we want to make sure that we are developing, uh, you know, refining and developing a process to ensure selection of proper uh, contract type and development of uh, proper requirements documentation so that we can put services on contract that we really do need uh, in a way that is uh, efficient. Uh, there's some questions that I think uh, you guys could help us answer. Uh, first, where are we as a department driving unnecessary cost in our service acquisitions? Uh, what is it that we're doing that is uh, making this an inefficient process? What could we do differently to reduce and eliminate those unnecessary costs? Uh, what are the non-value added tasks from your perspective uh, in our service acquisitions? Uh, things that we probably do not need to do. 
Uh, and in your view, has anyone in the department done a good job in shaking cost out of the service acquisitions? Uh, and if so, who and how have they done that? Uh, if you can identify areas where you think we have done it well, uh, we can use those as uh, benchmarks uh, for spreading that across the department. Uh, again, with all of the folks here at the table, we uh, want to thank you for the inputs that you will provide over the next few uh, weeks. Um, Randall, would you shut off your mic there, and that will make it easier for the other guys. Thank you. Uh, we're going to, before we open up for questions, I, I have two comments. We actually have the fifth uh, working group chair is with us by telephone. Unfortunately, we don't have the technology now to uh, let him uh, speak. So I'm, I'm sorry, Jamie. Um, uh, if I knew what you were going to say, I would say it for you. But uh, uh, we'll have to follow up with that uh, later. And I apologize for that. We didn't anticipate that uh, that need here. Could, could you identify the name, please? Uh, it's Jamie Dernan, and he is the uh, uh, measuring productivity growth uh, working group. Is that right? You'll notice we have all five working group tents up here, but there are actually only four people sitting behind them. It's not that they each get to do 1.25 additional uh, full-time jobs. So, actually, if I could, um, for a moment, it's uh, Nick Torelli who's the lead, and, and Nick is uh, unable to attend. We got noticed yesterday. We tried to accommodate to get here as quick as we could, uh, but Jamie was going to try to stand in for him. Uh, he's one of the team members. Right. All right. Thanks. Appreciate that. Um, I also, before we turn uh, the floor open uh, for questions, I would like to thank uh, the associations that were once again instrumental in uh, getting the word out for this and uh, making sure that uh, many of the right people who needed to be here uh, could be here on such short notice. And I see uh, a number of, of uh, those associations in attendance today. And of course, each of you has multiple people you can blame for your being here or, or reward accordingly. Uh, but, uh, but we really appreciate the collaborative and cooperative effort, particularly on the, with the kind of notice that we've had here. So I want to extend our thanks uh, to that regard as well. Um, with that, uh, I'll uh, ask you to uh, uh, think about your questions. Here's the procedure that we follow. As you know, uh, you'll raise your hand. I'll, I'll uh, uh, note you. Uh, you'll wait for the microphone. Uh, you'll stand up and uh, speak into the mic so the folks on the phone can hear you. Identify who you are and, uh, and who you're with or with whom you are. I'm not quite sure how to do that grammatically. Anyway, uh, and then you can ask your question. So uh, do we have any volunteers who, uh, who have a question they'd like to ask? Um, let me start with the microphone over here in the uh, uh, third row on the right-hand side. Elena, if you would. Hi, um, Bill Greenwald uh, with Lockheed Martin, and a uh, couple questions, but it's, it's mostly about the inputting exercise. Uh, the, uh, in, in, the what industry inputs, what criteria are going to be used for evaluation? What, what will we put in? And the second is, it does seem like these are kind of specific requirements that we're putting in. Is there going to be, but it also doesn't seem like there's anything just to look at an overall general critique of the, the various areas. I mean, is, is there opening for us to do that as well? In the, uh, in the action, in the uh, input uh, procedure. Yeah, I can take that, a absolutely. So, you know, this is a, uh, I joked with Dr. Hamry earlier when I was asked to, to come into the building, I was asked that they, you know, wanted me to think outside the box. They just didn't tell me. One, I had five sides on my box, and one of them was the general counsel's uh, side. So the way where um, we need to uh, do this to receive serious industry input is we've, we, I look at it as a funnel process. We're going to be as open and as wide as we can be to get initial inputs on various segments. Uh, our office will then uh, review those and we will work with the, the team leads, uh, uh, with Jim and, and Katrina in particular, to figure out what buckets. Some of them may go into more than, you know, some of these may go into more than one bucket. And then uh, enter them into their internal evaluation process. At that point in time, it is likely we will be reaching back to the people who made specific suggestions if they fit in the buckets. Now, if there are more general suggestions, and in fact, we received one yesterday, which I found incredibly interesting, that is more general and broad about how the department writ large, not just in these buckets, could be doing something more effectively, then that, those suggestions will take directly to uh, the SIG, to the, to the group. So uh, the, the, my goal in this process is to have it be a process, to be able to quantify the number of entries we have, and, and as Katrina, I think, rightly pointed out, and, 
this is we, we have, we're going to be looking for low-hanging fruit initially, but this will not be the end of the effort. So there may be some very good suggestions that we get from industry that will take longer to implement or maybe are out of our control, but things we can work with legislative affairs and, and the Congress to implement over a period of time. And those will be kept, but they may not make their way into the September uh, directives. So nothing's off the table? Nothing is off the table. Absolutely nothing is off the table. It, I, I think Except getting rid of one of the services. Okay, yeah. <laughs> True efficiency, right. I, I think, though, you heard all, all of the representatives up here this morning say that the, the, uh, the ideas are not just limited to what you can do better, but what DOD can do better as well, and I think that's a very powerful suggestion. Um, I think we had another uh, question right next to, to Bill there, and I'll ask the, uh, the, uh, Brad, if you would, when you answer the question, kind of repeat it so the folks on the phone can make sure they, they got it as well. Thanks. A couple of questions. First one is you're looking for some very specific input from industry as to provide you with our Cord Sterling with Aerospace Industries Association. Um, you're looking at very specific input from industry. You've talked about some general ideas, uh, things that you want to look at on the government side. Will you be providing us specifics on things you can do internally to streamline the process to make it more efficient for us? and then allow us to provide you with sort of our thoughts on those ideas, whether or not we think they'd work or not. And the second is it goes to the September memo. In what uh, Secretary Carter put out earlier, the second page seems to indicate he's going to put out very clear directives to the uh, various offices, which looks like they're going to be budget reductions, targets to contracts, and we're on a very accelerated path. Uh, is that really what's being looked at is a budget wedge which will be factored into the upcoming budget, and are we sure that we're going to meet those numbers? Those of us who worked in Congress over the years and lived through Secretary Hamry's uh, discussion about re declining budgets, we saw wedges used quite a bit, and it created more problems and more inefficiencies and increased costs than it did actually efficiency, so we're hoping to avoid that. Let me take the first one, and if you guys want to cut. Th this is not a, a budget drill. I'm going to be very clear about that. Uh, we anticipate uh, that the budget will remain uh, actually increasing in real terms. This is about us turning fat into muscle, uh, and, and so it is not a budget drill. Um, we are looking for ways to improve efficiencies. We will not replicate 46 percent growth over the last decade, and we're looking for ways to improve our efficiencies internally. Uh, we are, the reason we're reaching out to industry in the manner we are is because we are very aware of the unintended consequences uh, that sometimes occur uh, to the industrial base <coughs> when the department takes unilateral action. So we do want to share and be transparent and open in the dialogue. We don't want to get into a situation where, whether it's the auto industry or any other industry you can think of, where if you're, if you're forcing profitability down in our key customer bases, that's just passed down to the parts uh, suppliers. That's not what this is about. This is about how we do our job better and how we can help you do your job better. Yeah, I, I would just uh, pile on a little bit and say, uh, Roger, your point about, uh, about wedges. In fact, uh, as we've talked to Dr. Carter and Mr. Kendall, the whole point here is to do everything we can to, uh, to, to avoid that. Find the areas that that really, whether it's practices, policies, procedures, behaviors, incentives, whatever that may be, where can we take those ideas, those those uh, ways forward, and maybe take more risk, you know, in uh, in shifting money from some areas to make uh, more into or put some of those monies into product. So the whole idea here is to do everything we can to to avoid the the the, the wedge issue going forward. Uh, those are always a threat, you know, understand that, but uh, I think in a nutshell, that's really the point of all of this, is to, to do everything we can to avoid that. I'm uh, delighted to report that the uh, uh, phone email interaction is working very well. Um, I apologize again to the people in the room, but I do have to ask if you are on the phone, please put your phone on mute. There's a lot of interference that's making it difficult for everybody else to hear. So if you're listening in, please put your phone on mute. Um, next question uh, here in the front on the, on the left. It's uh, only your left, David. That's Alan Schmatkin, Professional Services Council. Uh, there's a the acquisition system, sometimes referred to as an ecosystem. It has a lot of cross-cutting implications. Uh, Jim, you mentioned that uh, one of the roles of the executive director is to be the integration agent. 
So uh, there's some things that are on the table, and there seems to be things in the system that are uh, driving costs that are n either not represented here in the room today or maybe outside of AT&L, DCAA, DCMA, some of the requirement side. Do those only get addressed at the integration level if they're, they don't fall nicely into one of the buckets, and how do we see them, or should we only focus on things in the AT&L five side of the box? Uh, actually, what the references that you made, i.e. DCMA, et cetera, they're included in our <laughs> database. In other words, if I need to reach out to get information from DCAA or OMB or GAO or anyone, I have full authority from Dr. Carter and support to do that from those principles. So they will be included. If I look at contract terms, that has implications for buying services. If I include or exclude a contract type, that impacts productivity or services. Does that get addressed in the contract type discussion, in the services discussion, or at the integration level, or at the SIG, or not at all? I, I get your point. I thought you were thinking we didn't have a full uh, cadre of support from the various expertise the uh, department has to offer. Yes, we do that integration. In fact, we have uh, weekly team meetings because we anticipate it's not a vertical drop. In fact, much of what we're seeing is redundancies across in certain areas. You heard two of the members already speak to that in the use of contract types. So yes, we will be doing that integration. Let's uh, do another one here on the right side of the room, but the left side of the speaker. Hey, David, thanks for having us here. J.B. Burns from BAE. It's a procedural question, and if it's possible to go to the chart that shows uh, the flow, uh, could you describe uh, interface for industry with each of those five committees, and then who would be the representation on the IWG from industry on the left side? Uh, we'll need to go back to our CEOs and tell them how they are expected to play and also the various uh, businesses. So if you could just generalize that answer for us and tell us how that's going to work for industry, other than just the inputs that you've already spoken to. Sure. Well, the, the current uh, plan is that for all industry inputs, uh, the Office of Industrial Policy will be the, the belly button, if you will, for the department in, in both uh, receiving the inputs and then working with uh, Jim and Katrina to figure out where uh, those suggestions or input should be placed either in one or more uh, of the teams or uh, if it is something that uh, goes above everything, whether it's a, a question of auditing or so forth, whether it goes directly to the, uh, uh, to the SIG for suggestions. Uh, my anticipation would be over time, and it's a short amount of time, that these team leads will be reaching out to individuals uh, who make these suggestions to obtain uh, more clarity and fidelity. And that will take place on a one-on-one -on -one basis uh, with the people who make the suggestions and the team leads. But the, our office will be the, the belly button for the, uh, for the inputs. Uh, can you just talk to the IWG, though? What's, what is that? And who's in it? How does it work? The, that is this. This is uh, that's our group. I'm sorry, I can't see you there, but uh, uh, that is the industrial policy uh, group, and, uh, uh, and it's my team, many of whom are, are back here. So yeah. All right, uh, on the front here. Then we'll go to the middle. Uh, Bill Courtney with uh, CSC. Um, two questions. Uh, Dr. Gansler has pointed out that competitive sourcing, even when the government uh, team wins, uh, saves a significant amount of money, I think 30 percent over a wide range of cases. Is competitive sourcing part of what you're looking at? And then secondly, um, Dr. Carter pointed out that acquisition is you know, 400 billion of the 700 billion total defense budget, uh, and if the goal is to save up to 3 percent per year across DOD, is the personnel side of DOD, the 300 billion part, are they going to go to war on overhead, such as on health care costs, 
If not, it would seem that acquisition would have to save per year over 3% in order to meet the department-wide goal. Under um, leverage um, comp real competition, I think the competitive sourcing would be addressed there. So yes, I mean, we've touched on that again. It's our first week, but that is obviously one of the subjects we'll, we'll tackle. And, and on things outside of the purview of AT&L, and uh, you know, so some of the and the, ser the service executives uh, are represented in the in the senior working group, and I think where we'll see any kind of recommendations on the issues, whether it's personnel or O and M or healthcare, will be coming not through this five group that will work with industry specifically, but will be coming through the uh, in internal military department recommendations, which will also be addressed as as part of the initiative. I have one question that's come in from the phone that uh, that I would like to ask. And is it uh, the one I wrote to you? Uh, not, not. We ha <laughs> actually, I'll tell you who this is from at the end of the conversation. Um, the question is on uh, on in incorporating affordability into requirements, uh, and it says it's difficult for uh, industry uh, to uh, speak. Excuse me, my phone just faded away. Uh, to speak directly to the question of affordability and requirements when you're in the middle of actually negotiating that with the um, uh, uh, military departments. Um, how do you expect industry to provide you comments on affordability of requirements? And the email is sent through Hushpoint, so I actually can't tell from whom it came, which indicates the seriousness, I suppose, of the question of can you, can you expect, how do you expect industry to speak frankly on things where, um, where they're worried about uh, the dynamics of that conversation? Okay, that's not the one I sent you. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, you know, we've just spent a week um, going through from a government side on each one of the initiatives. So I think probably the best way to handle it is to, to submit those through um, defense procurement and let us factor that in as we start working through each one of our issues. I mean, I'm not in a position to address that today, and I don't really think this is the right forum to do that. And I just say but that's why I tried to make the po uh, point of we learn by experience. So we, have, we all have a lot of anecdotes about what we could have done better and what we should have done better. But I think... If you think about this initiative as moving forward, uh, we may not, and let's just be honest, in that particular instance, w this, this process may not address that concern. But how do we, if it is a mistake the department is making and it's not in the best interest of the warfighter and taxpayer, how do we make sure we don't make that mistake again in the future? Uh, and that's why the process we're, we're closely monitoring in industrial policy, uh, the, the sensitivity of uh, competition sensitive information and proprietary information, and we will take that very seriously. And if uh, there are reasons to blind it, even among our internal team, we will do so. Could I add a moment? I, I want to make sure under understanding is clear out there that we're not looking for specific uh, issues that you're being faced with on the day. You want to make it generic because it has to be long term. I can't. Uh, Combat ID has a similar issue. You can't fix the gray matter. You can only provide the tools. So what we're doing is trying to make sure that we have an understanding of those things that are long-term and deep that can be provided across the agency. And on the implementation on a one-for-one -one basis, we have to address those on a one-for-one -one basis. So just to make it clear. All right. Let's come down in front and then we'll work back. Uh, John Bava with Deloitte Consulting, and I had a question about the um, under-targeting affordability, uh, the comment on eliminating redundancy within the warfighting portfolios. Is it the charter of this group to actually make d d or offer decisions on elimination opportunities within that portfolio, or is it a uh, interest in industry's perspective on process and procedures for effective decision making on that? Yeah, that's what we're tackling first is the, the process and the procedures to make sure that we on the government side are doing everything possible to identify any redundancies that may exist and preclude them from going forward in, in the future. Uh, it's entirely possible you may come to conclusions that others don't like, and, uh, and obviously that's part of the process of the ongoing feedback that uh, Brett talked about earlier. So. If I could just comment on that, I mean, that's true. You know, we may, we may come up with a lot of processes and procedures that we want to do in-house or things that we think is prudent for the government to do. 
I think it's important. You may not like it, but what we want to do is make sure that we work together so we're on a, on a level playing field and a common understanding of how we want to proceed forward. And that, and that we've heard you, we've listened to you, and we factored those things into the decisions that we make. Uh, and that's clearly one of the critical dynamics that uh, uh, time constraint is such that it's got to be done fairly quickly. And I think the, the memorandum that uh, Ms. Lambert sent out that uh, in advance of this indicates the need for those kind of regular updates. And since there isn't much time, it uh, becomes really critical. Um, let's go to uh, one question in the middle and then in the back here. Hi, uh, Professor Steve Schooner from the George Washington University. And let me just more of a comment than a question, and I'll do this to represent the, the skeptics and the cynics who may not want to speak in this forum, but let me just offer a few things to think about as you embark on this. And I guess the first one I want to start with is your first message. One thing that we've heard time and time again today is you're all working second jobs, nights and weekends, doesn't inspire confidence. It reflects the exact same problem that probably is the primary cost driver, is the DOD gutted its acquisition workforce and didn't invest in succession planning for two decades. No one believes Shea Assad when he says he's going to fix it, and none of the signs suggest it's going to be done. Well, thank you. I think I received three semester credits. <laughs> I'll have my transcript changed uh, for um, that. Uh, I, you know, you know, I, I, there, there's skepticism internally or skepticism externally. Uh, uh, I think Dr. Carter has it dead on, as, as does the secretary himself. We didn't get into this issue overnight. This is not a decades on. This is a 20-year problem that's been compiling. And uh, being from the Midwest, compounded interest is a very important thing to me. Uh, so this is not, we're not going to unwind this in September. We, we realize there are structural problems. And we just need to do the changes now to prevent other people from doing them for us that are in the best interest of our industrial partners so that we do incentivize and reward, whether it's profitability or competition. And we also make the internal changes uh, that we need to make inside the department that prepares us for the 2020s. And we're not there yet, and it's going to take some time. So skepticism is fine. I'm, I'm okay with skepticism. 
but I want you to know that we are committed inside the building and that uh, Dr. Carter's finger is very sharp when it's in your chest. I'm, I'm going to put a hiatus on the questions at the moment because the fifth uh, issue group has joined us here and um, let uh, Jamie Dernan come up and talk a little bit about uh, his, his uh, issue group measuring productivity growth. Thanks, Dave, and I apologize. Uh, I was trying to deal with productivity growth uh, with uh, U.S. Airlines. I was putting my 11-year-old on a plane at 7 o'clock this morning, and it decided to take off at 9.20. So, uh, so we had a good conversation. I will be very short. I was on the phone. I was listening to the other teams. Uh, we, uh, I'm representing Nick Torelli, uh, as uh, was discussed. Nick is the uh, team lead for measuring productivity growth. Uh, we are working very hard. Uh, the big problem is, is that uh, we probably as much or maybe more than every other team here will need industry, uh, both the defense industry and the private sector's assistance in figuring out what measuring productivity growth is all about. I mean, it's all about benchmarking. We're going to be reaching out not only internally inside the Department of Defense, but also outside uh, through Brett's office with industry uh, trying to figure out how industry benchmarks uh, productivity, how you, how you measure growth, and uh, see how that applies to the Department of Defense. There'll be a lot of conversations. This is a rolling, uh, we will have something substantive uh, within the time that we're required, but this will continue on because it's uh, very important and it reaches across all f four or five of the teams and in the, in the initiative in general. Thank you. All right, uh, I think we have a question, a couple more questions uh, time for, and so uh, one back here on the back side. I'm Ron Perlman. I'm from Holland and Knight and a member of the Manufacturing Division of the National Defense Industrial Association. The question is, uh, in connection with the affordability and efficiency drives that are being undertaken, how is the domestic industrial base and the effect of these initiatives on the domestic industrial base, especially the mid-tier suppliers, being taken into account? If I could, in, in the spreadsheet that you should have access to, that was the data to collection derive device that Brett posted, it, it is almost, uh, well, I should say we plagiarized each other. It's pretty much the common data entry set, and in there you will see that as an entry. For us, it's a component of all of our initiatives. So it's not just small business, it's also uh, what we call uh, special materials or, or limited materials. I, I know there's another name out there, I'm sure, that talks about rare earth material. And so anything from material to small industries that are ones of a kind like Paxi and others, uh, those are considered part of the equation that we have to consider. I just say uh, my office is almost completely focused on this second and ter third tier issue because it is a, it's a driving force and we don't want to have uh, actions that we take that have these unintended consequences. It makes no sense for us uh, to in essence support three or four prime contractors if all of them are relying on the same second and third tier vendor that's about ready to go out of business because of capital constraints uh, on their cash flow. So we're, we're very focused on that. Uh, second and third tier. I mean, we're, we, we, we look at backlogs, we look at health of industry, uh, and that is certainly a focus of our office independent of this particular effort. Hi, uh, Neil Albert with MCR, and also uh, representing NDIA's Program Management Systems Committee. But uh, my question has to do with the uh, services acquisition piece that Randall talked about. He, he had in there, um, it's kind of a question in terms of uh, definition. Uh, he mentioned the statement that said that he's going to look at what you don't need and what you do need in terms of services. And um, with the insourcing scenario that's going on today as well, uh, how does that play in there? Because we're all kind of wondering what we do need and what we don't need, and definitionally wise, I'm we're more than happy to support, but trying to figure out what it is. Over the last few years, uh, as we have grown our service acquisition arena, we may have moved some activities outside the government that need to be inside. And if you have insights that would help us to better define inherently governmental, uh, for instance, that would be a, a good path to go down. Uh, 
we, you know, you have to look at it from a philosophical standpoint. Using contract, the contractor community to support the services arena provides us some flexibility. One of the issues that we may have uh, is the, the way that our funding is, is uh, set up may be providing uh, impetus for us to contract out more than we would if we had a little bit greater funding flexibility for our service acquisitions. So that's an area that may be ripe for uh, looking at. Uh, what we want to do is uh, do this smartly. Uh, most of you sitting in this room know, uh, uh, not just anecdotally but by experience, that a lot of the service acquisitions that we have that are characterized as non-personal services may in fact be personal services. Uh, and uh, we need to, I think, uh, tackle that issue and, and get it right. So that's an area that is ripe as well. Okay. One last question. This will be our final one, and then we'll, uh, and, and hopefully this one will actually have a question mark at the end of it. Can I have one comment, one question? <laughs> <coughs> comment is inherently government. <laughs> no, I taught him everything he knows, though. Um, I'm Mike Love from CSC, and uh, the comment is OMB is addressing inherently governmental. I would hate to have redundancy in a DOD also in investigating that. I would strongly suggest you don't get into that. The question is, uh, the, you, uh, as I see it, there's a significant defect in this process, and that is filtering industry participation and input to these uh, working groups through your office. If the, if the problem is a, a question of legal flexibility uh, and general counsel at DOD saying there's no way we can do that, I would offer, uh, I think there's a lot of people in this room would offer their services to ex help DOD get more flexible about getting that information. This has got to be a dialogue. If it's just throwing things back and forth across the fence, you're not going to get there. Uh, okay, I didn't see the question mark, but I get I get the drift of where you were going with it. Um, that's right. That's right. Uh, I don't. It, it's not meant to be a, a filter, and it's and I don't mean to say this is just an OGC issue. This is uh, we're trying to be efficient uh, and as efficient as possible. So we need to make sure we are collecting and bucketing appropriately the recommendations and suggestions, and trying to be efficient and streamlined in the way we're getting them to these team leads. Um, these people are, you know, these uh, folks in their first and only job are meeting uh, uh, regularly internally uh, as well. So we'll, these, these meetings are taking place several times uh, a week and all of this input will be put to them and then I would expect that there'll be direct interaction between the groups, sometimes more than one group. So I think this is more of a process issue. Uh, as opposed to a legal issue, of course there's a legal component to it. We want to make sure we're collecting all the information we need to collect uh, and make sure we uh, treat it appropriately and get it to the right people. And it's just functionally a lot easier to do that through a single belly button than to have people running around the building uh, with ideas in hand. Let me make a couple of final comments before we wrap it up. Um, you go back to what Dr. Hamry said at the beginning, you'll see that he used the word we in a way that is broader than CSIS or his own entity that he's standing up here representing. I know many of you, and I know that most of those of you who I know spent a lot of time working in the government or with the government on important national security issues. I know that while you all have responsibilities to the people who pay your paychecks, almost every one of you, in fact, every one of you that I know, and so I suspect everybody in this room, has a higher calling that they're working for as well here. And I think what you see in this effort is at least the potential to exercise that very broad definition of we and bring it into play in a very short period of time in a dynamic that if we don't do it as well as we can is likely to produce a worse outcome rather than a better one. This is the game we have. We need to play it as well as we can. My encouragement to you is keep that broad definition of the word we in mind as we go forward here. I want to thank the guests who are up on the platform because I know you all are trying to do that. I want to thank all of you for your participation, all of you on the phone uh, for having gone through the technical challenges of, of calling in. 
And I know that over the next few weeks, uh, uh, this is going to continue to get a lot of attention. So thanks for coming, uh, and best of luck as we go forward from here.